Um, as I said, my wife and I, we had our first son August 1st. His name is Connor. And uh, uh, I, I'll i never forget his birth. Um, I uh, Two things happened when I watched my son come out of, the, out of my wife's womb. The first thing was my heart exploded with love for her. Um, because of, of what she just endured. Um, not not just in that moment, not just in the labor, but in the nine months of thinking of it all, and all all that effort paid off, and, and what it what it produced, like it, it it produced a real result. It was called person. And the second thing that that I thought, and which is kind of a dorky thought, I humbly admit to have, is, um, man, I've really sterilized the incarnation in my life. Like, I don't know about you, but when I think about the birth of Jesus, I think about a Norman Rockwell painting. I think most of the world does. You think of a really nice, clean environment, and there's angels, and the shepherds, the one that passed out when he saw the angels, he woke back up, you know? <laughs> and they're all singing, and everybody's, everybody's happy, but childbirth's messy. Yeah. It's really messy. <laughs> but the most amazing thing is, is that that's how God chose to enter the world. Like, God, God chose that, and he, he elevated that. I, I, don't even, I don't even know if you ever thought about this way. I just spent a day yesterday, I was at Truro uh, Church. It's an Anglican church. And there was a, a speaker by the name of Christopher West who, who spoke. And he's dedicated his whole life to breaking open 125, I think, or 127 sermons that John Paul II did over a span of many years on marriage, family, the human person, human sexuality. It's called the theology of the body. But essentially what he talks about is before the world was ever made, there was love. You had, there was perfect love. Because you had, you had a lover, you had a beloved, and you had the love in between the two of them. You had a father who loved his son. You had a son who received the love and gave it back. And he had the love in between them, which was so powerful that it created a third person, a Holy Spirit. He said, well, the, the, the living sign that God uses in the world to demonstrate that is a marriage. Is a man and a woman who love each other and lay their lives down for each other so much and give each other self gifting to each other so much that it actually produces another person. So abortion at its heart is not just an offense because it's a murder. It's an offense because it disfigures the very image that God chose to display himself to the world. I didn't, another thought I, I, I realized uh, came, it dawned upon me was um, I, I, more and more in my life, I'm like, God, you have to be intentional about everything you do because you're God. Like, it, I, I'm, I'm not intentional about everything I do. <laughs> so God had to be very intentional about the fact that he picked a 14-year-old girl and he picked an unplanned pregnancy to come into the world. So that, so that literally that the Savior of the world was born of, of a situation that is essentially in the greatest dilemma in the 20th century, the 21st century. That, that more people now have died from abortion in the United States from a situation that, that literally describes how God entered the world. And I think he did it because he knew 2,000 years later we would be at this moment and there would be, a, there would be millions of young women who, like Mary, are confronted with this moment of saying, look, we know that this wasn't part of your plan, maybe, in life, for whatever reason, but now you're with this situation. And this life, this gift, was made in the image and likeness of God. You have the opportunity to bring it into the world. Your yes is going gonna, is gonna to affect the destiny of another human being. And little did Mary know, all well, she knew, that, that, that her yes was going to affect the destiny of all of us. But I think that the reason God did that is because he was trying just to show the power that we have in our choices. I, I find it so funny that so many women just, they yell about the fact that they have a choice. I think God's like, of course you have a choice. That's how I made you. 
That's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about whether or not you have a choice. What we're talking about is the consequences of that choice. What we're talking about is that, is that the power you have when you say yes, the potential that you have when you say yes. And that's something that a woman has that a man will never have. I don't have it. And so I, I think that for such a time as this is where we are in our nation's history, I think we just, the best thing that the church could do, that we could do right now, is to pray not just one day, but 365 days for all of these women. That God would supply them fully with the grace they need to make the most courageous decision of their lives, which is to lay down their life for another. To lay down their dreams for another. To lay down their fears for another. No greater love has the world ever seen is when one lays down their life for another. And that's essentially what happens when you decide to be a mom. Or when you accept the call to be a mom. Because it's a call. And so um, I, I asked my wife, I told her I was coming to do this. I said, I, I kind of feel like I'm out of my league. And uh, I don't really know what to say. <laughs> and so she said, well, just be yourself. I said, okay. okay. <laughs> and I said, but I said, I don't know any women who've had an abortion. She goes, no, you probably do. And so I've been carrying that burden to me. And I'm going, you know what? I'm going to try to do my part to help create and foster a culture within the church. That, that, that at this point says, you know what, grace. Grace, grace, grace. No more in my life, um, you know, Jesus walks up to a woman caught in adultery and he says, um, you know, is there anybody left to condemn you? She says, no. And so I, I I'm realizing I have to change my paradigm when it comes to this because I think there's a whole host of people who want to come forward and they want to be unburdened. But right now, because of the culture that we have within the church, they don't feel free. So this this axiom of what Paul says in Scripture that, that Jesus said to him, of my grace is sufficient, um, we're not creating an environment where that, that apparently is true. Because if grace was sufficient, all of these people would come forward. They'd come running home. And so that, as I, as I uh, kind of move into a time of prayer, and maybe you pray with me, maybe we just pray for it, that the church would, would storm the gates of heaven and ask God to, to, to change the heart of the nation. But more importantly, fill our hearts with grace that we could extend it to these young women that we'd be willing to support them as they make this courageous decision, as they say yes, just like a small yes 2,000 years ago changed the course of human history. So, Father, we come before you this morning um, just in the, in the halls of this building where so many decisions are made. And first and foremost, God, I just pray that you impart wisdom all these men and women who serve uh, the American people. And we, we pray that, that today a seed is planted, God, on this ground um, that grows a, a real culture of life again in this country. But more importantly, before any of that, um, we pray for hearts um, that would constantly pray for grace. That for every young woman, young or old, Who's thinking about walking in the doors of an abortion clinic? That you would intersect their path with somebody who would just simply um, bring that message of grace to them. That you give them courage to see the, the weight and the power they have truly as women. To lay down their lives for another. Pray for any of them struggling that uh, is feeling forgiven that, that you remind them that your grace is sufficient. Great is your 
Still 